Well, thanks for continuing the journey on uh, the five things that Medicaid wants you to get wrong. Uh, this is the second video mm -hmm. in the series. And this one, there's a lot of uh, depth to this. This is a, one of the areas that is very confusing. Mm -hmm. If people are going to get just caught up in the morass of things, trying to do this on their own, this is a place where there are a bunch of trip points. And it really is making sure you understand income versus resources, and then even within resources, countable resources versus non-countable resources. Exactly. And kind of stepping back, what this really boils down to are the three tests for in-facility nursing home or waiver Medicaid eligibility. The first test is the level of care test, and that's what basically the amount of assistance that, a, that an individual needs. If a person is admitted to a nursing facility or they receive a Medicaid waiver slot, which is well beyond the, the, the subject of this yeah. video, then they're going to pass that first test. But the second test is income, and the third is the resource test. And so in order to establish that an applicant passes those two tests, we need to deal with income and resources and the differences between them. Specifically, income is generally, as you would imagine, those sources of repeating, recurring monthly payments to the applicant and the applicant's spouse. These are going to be things like Social Security, railroad uh, retirement, pension payments, VA benefits, um, potentially in the case of, say, an annuity, a recurring annuity payment, or uh, the interest, uh, the recurring interest on a promissory note, pay, uh, note, or even a land sale contract. Those recurring, repeating sources of payments from a third party generally in relation to employment. And even, say, repeating IRA distributions would also be budgeted as income and self-employment. Or, say, for example, an individual owns an LLC interest and that produces income. Say they own a rental property. Right. The rent would then be prorated over a year and paid in, or if they're renting farm ground, the same kind of idea. Resources are those concrete things that an individual owns. They may be income sources in and of themselves, but essentially there are those things that can be reducible to cash or things that are otherwise owned. This could be household goods and furnishings. This could be you know, jewelry, uh, real estate, somebody's house. Uh, this could be you know, collections or hobby items or income producing property or equipment. Um, most commonly it's things like say a bank account or certificates of deposit, vehicles, um, or in investment accounts or, or stocks or bonds. All of those things that uh, a person can own that are basically con you know, concrete items um, that could then be reduced to cash are going to count as resources. And they're going to apply to these two tests. Now there's a third category of things that Medicaid looks at and those are transfers. Those are things you've given away. We kind of mentioned that in the first video. Now it's important to understand that for most items in the world of Medicaid, an a particular item is either income or its resources, but that it can change. For example, if you receive Social Security benefits in February, that's income in the month of February. If you hold on to it in your bank account in March, that dollar becomes a resource. And so you've got to account for these things in time, but also have a comprehensive inventory of what you're receiving and what you own. To make things more complicated, and I'm sorry that, that we have to, but this is the way that the Medicaid rules work, right. each type of income and each type of resource can be evaluated slightly differently. For example, I mentioned annuities and promissory notes. Well, annuity income is generally all income, while in the case of a promissory note, only the interest at this point is considered income. So you've got to look at not only the raw number that's there, but the type of income. And in the case of resources, resources are also going to count differently. Say, for example, a house that is occupied by a community spouse that's not applying for Medicaid, that's going to be considered a non-countable resource. So it's going to be in a different column than, say, a bank account balance, which is generally going to be considered an available resource and is going to count against eligibility. So we have to look at the raw numbers, how those things are changing in time, and then also the specific and unique nature of each of those assets in a comprehensive inventory and how those fit into the individual rules. Now this becomes, I mean, especially complicated when you're dealing with people who have accumulated assets over their entire lives. 
are maybe banking with multiple banks, have you know life insurance policies Lots that they bought of in the life 19- insurance policies yeah. that they maybe like bought. We might in have a client yeah. in that situation yeah. right now, right? Yeah. yeah, and that you're you know then having to run all of those documents down. So you're not only accounting, but then you've got to prove all of this to the caseworker and what's happened. Well, so and you- one of the other ones is um, IRAs. Absolutely. And so spouses' IRAs mm-hmm. versus the person's IRAs. Right. I mean, so those and and there's different right now. Different, yeah, different ways rules. of looking at those, right. but we will say that is one of these growing gray areas, mm-hmm. um, and probably a point of, mm-hmm. of something in the future we have to be really be aware absolutely. Of. And when you're dealing with that and you're trying to document all of this, you're working with third parties. It's not just the family working with right. the attorney and then the attorney working with Medicaid on that individual's behalf. It's now making requests out to third parties to provide documents, maybe documents going potentially you know months if not years into the past. Um, and the delays that that can create. I mean, some organizations are very good about producing materials that you need within a matter of a couple of days. Some, it may take weeks or even months to produce the things that are that are needed to satisfy a Medicaid caseworker. And it's not that a Medicaid caseworker is be, you know, being pernicious. Um, I feel very fortunate to work with the folks that we work with in filing applications. Um, by and large, they are, you know, well informed. They're trained as you know as well as they can be. They are definitely overloaded by the system, but they're you know they're trying to do you know good work and work with us. Um, but that said, they're you know they've got a manual that sets out specifically what they have to do to satisfy the state and be and fulfill the requirements of their job. And so we've got to fall in line with that. And oftentimes, um, you know that takes getting out to these third parties, the banks and account managers and getting those documents as soon as possible. And so the sooner we can make those requests, the sooner we can look at somebody's unique situation and everybody's situation is absolutely unique. Right. The sooner we can get working on that that part of the project and the sooner we can have a comprehensive plan that can work with a family to establish whether or not eligibility is possible and when it can be obtained. Um, and all of that, the sooner you can do that, um, you know, you're you're reducing the, the overall stress level and you're breaking things down instead of a giant question mark and not knowing what uh, needs to happen, not understanding the difference between income and resources to a clear to-do list that we can start to, to work down over the course of maybe a few weeks or even a few months right. and get us to that goal line in a comprehensive way that satisfies everybody. And it's really important to understand, I mean, what Chris is pointing out there is that um, it can make the difference between becoming eligible three months sooner mm-hmm. or three months later and at some place between seven and nine, maybe $10,000 a month. Mm-hmm. That's real money. When you're private paying in that period of time where if we would have gotten ahead, gotten everything together and, and been more adept to get the application mm-hmm. in as soon as we could, I mean, that's that's tens of thousands of dollars potentially that we're, that we're talking about. So, mm-hmm. you know, what we're not saying to you is go out and research this and and come up with all the answers of income and resources, what's countable, what's not, what can be, you know, flipped. Um, but but know that there are answers that you have. It's, it, your situation is very unique, how your structure is set up. Give us a chance to help you understand what your situation is. And we'll be honest, you know, it, you may not be eligible next month. Mm-hmm. The, the, it just may not be possible. Uh, it may be several months and we may have to put together a strategy based on your income, based on your resources. Mm-hmm. Um, but it... But both of those things, that one thing we didn't touch on is both of them have their own unique thresholds. Right. Income has a threshold and resources have a threshold. So having, you know, what status they're in and all those things, we need to get our hands around, mm-hmm. put some planning tools in place and make sure that everything is lined up, get all our ducks in a row and, and make sure that we are going to apply with the best chance of success. But let's get started. Um, you know, again, your situation is unique. Better to know what your situation is before it's too late. You know, sometimes you don't have a chance to plan ahead, Mm -hmm. but if you do have a chance to plan ahead, far better situation. So if we need three weeks, if we need three months, if we need two years, we've got a circumstance where Mm -hmm. you have a plan to get to where you want to be. Yeah. Uh, 219-230-3600. As we said, this is the second video in the series. If you're watching the second one, you've watched the first one. Uh, But the third one is going to touch on the other two points of the five things that we um, say Medicaid wants to see you get wrong. And that is thinking it's easy and also thinking you don't qualify. So we'll talk about that in the next video. But in the meantime, if you've got questions you want to talk about in your situation, again, give us a call. 219-230-3600. Thank you.